verses 1 and 4. We will need to stand, even though you're doing such a great <laughs> job smiling, but we have to stand. <laughs> Rent out the trailer 
as an Airbnb. It's very cute, isn't it? Yeah. It's very cute. It's, it's very adorable. cute. Yes, and I know Michelle and yeah. Susan have seen it. But anyway, they send their their greetings. I'll work on this. Thank you. That's all. <laughs> okay. Um, if you would please stand as you are able and join me in the responsive call to worship found on the front of your bulletin. A new day dawns. A new season of life begins. God's glory shines in the heavens and shimmers on the waters. A new outlook calls us into Christ's glorious future. We will feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick and the prison, and see Christ in every face we meet. Please remain standing and turn in the black hymnal to number 2130, and we will sing verses 1, 2, and 5 of the summons. that lie before us. Guide our footsteps into the glory of your ways. May our worship this day reflect the greatness of our calling and the glory of our heritage. Amen. Please turn to page 140 in the red handle, and we will sing the first two verses of Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Please join me in the responsive Psalter reading, Psalm 102, found on page 822 and 823 in the Red Hymnal. We will read verses 1 through 4, then 23 through 30, 28, I'm sorry, 23 through 28. We will not read verses 5 through 22. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. For my days pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is smitten like grass and withered. I am too wasted to eat my bread. The Lord has broken my strength in mid-course and has shortened my days. Oh my God, I say, do not take me away in the midst of my days, you whose years endure throughout all the generations. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you endure. They will all wear out like a garment. You change them like raiment, and they pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure, their posterity shall be established before you. Change my heart, O oh God. 
Let us pray. Almighty God, grant us grace to be asking, so to speak and so to hear, so to learn and so to love, that our minds may be enlightened, our faith strengthened, and our steps directed unto thee. Our scripture lesson today comes from the Old Testament, or Hebrew Bible, book of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Let us listen for these familiar verses as they are read to us. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and the time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now Laura Jascott will bring her sermon, Constancy and Change. Don't ask me the same thing. Is that a word? That's what you wanted me to say, too. Consistency in the words. Constancy. It's a Scrabble word. It's an actual word. I could remember that. Summer's here. Scrabble's on us. How many people have heard the phrase, the only thing constant in life is change? So just about everybody has heard that, right? And, and I retired two years ago. I think a lot of you know that as well. But while I was still working, I would hear people say that all the time at work, because things were always changing when we were at work. Now, I worked for Aetna. I'm a math geek, right? So I did, I did math for a living. And I managed a team of people that did math for a living. And uh, what we did was set rates for employers who offered insurance to their employees. So we would take last year's claims experience for the group of people, not individuals, but a group of people, and try to figure out what that would be next year, what it would cost next year. And that's how we would figure out the rates. And we had formulas. We had um, kind of rules that were given to us by the actuaries. And we would try to predict that. And using that prediction, we would quote the rates to employers, because I worked in the new business section, and those employers would need to make a decision about whether or not they wanted to purchase Aetna's insurance or stay with the company they currently have. Now, believe it or not, this can be a very difficult decision to make, because it is not just based on the price of the insurance. They need to weigh, employers need to weigh in to that decision the feelings and the concerns of their employees. Change can be pretty scary. If someone is sick and they're currently undergoing medical treatment, they're going to be very concerned about whether or not their doctor is in the new network for the new insurance carrier. It's not just as easy as saying, you're going to go from Aetna to Blue Cross and say, my doctor's not in the network, or, or something like that. It is a very scary thing. If someone is um, paying money out of their paycheck, is their price going to go up or is it going to stay the same? And employers had to weigh that in. And what we would often hear from the HR departments of the employers, that their treasurer really wanted to make the change because we were going to save them money. 
but the HR team was very concerned about the number of phone calls that they were going to get if the insurance <laughs> changed, and they were at odds with each other about whether or not this change should occur. And it's interesting when you're not in that business to think of it, how many different things can impact that. So they're all very big concerns to employers and employees, and the employers would need to make those decisions. So I think we've all heard that people fear change. They certainly don't like it very much. But I'm not sure that it's always true for all people that people fear change. I think as we get older, we learn to fear change a little bit more, actually, but I'm not even sure that it's change that people fear, but rather the uncertainty of what comes after the change. Will there be any loss associated with the change? When we're younger, we crave change. As we're growing and learning, it's exciting, right? Have you seen the face of a baby after he or she takes their, her first or his first unassisted steps? Right? They are super excited to be walking, right? This is, I can get around now and I don't have to have anybody helping me and I can go over there or yeah. over there or over there. It's exciting for them. They're not worried about, oh no, now I can walk, what am I going to do? They're excited and this is great. Um, most children I know can't wait to go to school, especially if they have an older brother or sister who has been going out and they've been stuck at home. They want to go to school. I teach Sunday school and over the years I've had different age groups and I particularly remember one time when the nursery was my Sunday school class, I had um, freshmen and sophomores in the class and none of them could wait till they were old enough to drive. Now. I told them to let me know when they were going to be on the road because they couldn't pay attention for 45 minutes to what I considered a very interesting Sunday school lesson. I wanted to know where they were going to be driving. But once a couple of them would get their licenses, they actually said, and this is a disturbing thought, I haven't had my accident yet. As if it was a rite of passage to get into a car crash. But, you know, and unfortunately for one girl, no sooner did she say that the following week she was broadsided and she came in, I was in my accident. Okay, I've been driving for 40 years and I've not had one. I, I, it's okay to not get in an accident. But changes that bring more freedom, such as driving, are usually, and, and autonomy, are usually very exciting to young people. As we get older, change can be a little more stressful. A change in leadership at work can cause a concern for job security. Um, we used a tool for the longest time that was based in Excel to calculate rates at work, and they changed the tool we used to a, a, a cloud-based tool. And the people on my team were very concerned that they weren't going to know how to use it, and they were slower when we started using the tool because they had to learn the new tool, and it was concerning. They were very uh, worried about it. It took more time. They had more errors, and they were worried about losing their jobs because of this, because of the change in the tool that we used. A change in routine can be very stressful. It takes somebody out of their, their routine. I, I, my mom is now 90, and if we do something a little bit different, it's a little stressful for her. And then she, you know, she feels it in her stomach, right? And it's like, oh, my stomach's in knots. We're going to go a different way to the doctor today. And you know, I'm like, well, let's learn a new way. But um, how many of you have ever stressed over changing the paint color in a room? You run home all those little oh, yeah. tiles with all the color chips on, you hold them up to the wall. What's going to look good? What's going to look good? Um, ladies, how about changing your pocketbooks? Anybody worry about I hate changing my pocketbooks. I like knowing where everything is. And the first time you change your pocketbook, you can't find your keys, you can't find your phone. Where was that pen? Oh, my goodness. Neither painting nor changing a pocketbook is a permanent, irrevocable change, but both cause stress, right? Who here, most of you will remember this, when Coke changed their formula and they had new Coke? <laughs> that was April of 1985. Wow. The new formula was rolled out, the old formula was discontinued the same week. Coke was so sure that that new formula was going to boost their sales, and, and, and they were competing with Pepsi, as they still do. That did not last long. The backlash included over 40,000 calls and letters from consumers, especially those in the South, where Coke is made. And uh, within three months, Coca-Cola Classic was back on the shelves. Peter Jennings even interrupted General Hospital to share the news. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big deal. It took Coke until 2002 to officially discontinue the new formula internationally. And to this day, they don't consider it a failure, but... So who said the only thing constant is change? I looked it up, 
And the quote is attributed to an ancient philosopher, Heraclitus of Ephesus, who lived, lived from 530 to 470 BC. And he is known as one of the most important thinkers in history, in part because his views on change and flow were in stark contrast to the picture of the static universe that people generally believed back then. And Heraclitus said that life is like a river. The peaks and troughs, pits and swirls are all part of it. And nature is in a constant state of flux. Nature is change, and like a river, it flows ever onwards. And even the nature of the flow changes. So if you look at a river, you're never actually looking at the same river, right? The water has passed by, so the water you're looking at is always different. So you could consider that the river is different. So I looked up change. I found quite a few uh, synonyms for change, including development, advance, innovation, transition, variety, diversity, transformation, metamorphosis. And while the word change itself might imply something that's scary or maybe even unpleasant, those words convey, at least to me, a much more positive feeling. What do you think of when you hear the word metamorphosis? A butterfly, of course. And, you know, changing from a caterpillar, which is not always very attractive, into a beautiful butterfly. The same with the word advance. It's a positive word, moving ahead, moving up. Development, innovation, new creativity, ideas, ways of doing things. And transformation. I immediately thought of the transfiguration of Christ on the mountaintop. Alternatively, I also looked up antonyms to change and found words that, at least to me, had a much more negative connotation. Stagnation, sameness, uniformity. I did a children's sermon one time on what if we all were exactly the same. That would be very boring. I'm a birder. I like seeing all the different kinds of birds we have. I can't imagine if there was only one to look at. That would be boring. And I also researched some ancient Eastern philosophers and their studies and teachings. And it seems a lot of companies today, Aetna was one of them, was dealing with change and the stress that it caused by bringing mindfulness into the workplace. And I don't know if you know much about mindfulness, but it's basically being present in the moment. <coughs> how you are aware of what's going on around you and how you react to that particular situation. It's a new term, it's not a new concept. So there are mindfulness practices we can do, we call them meditation. Um, we have ways to deal with things, and if you consistently deal with something in a new manner, it will become habit to you. So instead of immediately lashing out at somebody, and I have a mouth on me, some of you know that I get mad, um, if I stop and wait 10 seconds before I say what's in my head and it comes out through my no filter, that is probably a better choice, right? So there are ways to deal with change and ways that we can do things that are different. And if you act as if you are different, over time you will be, and that is a positive thing. But change is real and necessary. For salvation, we must change our minds to agree that God's way is better than our way. For spiritual maturity, we must allow the Holy Spirit to change us. Paul writes this in several letters, including in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. But change is also scary. People like the status quo. They know and understand what is and what's coming, but for Christians, change should be welcomed. Change requires repentance, a change in heart resulting in a change in actions. We are constantly learning more about God and changing to be more like him. Even Jesus changed when he was a boy, increasing, remember these words, increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Chapter 4, verses 22 to 24, he writes, Change the former way of life that was part of the person you once were, corrupted by deceitful desires. Instead, renew the thinking in your mind by the Spirit, and clothe yourself with the new person, created according to God's image, in justice and true holiness. The first verses that came to mind for me when I was thinking about changing were the verses that Kevin Bacon quoted in the movie Footloose when he was trying to get the pastor of the town to change his stance and allow a dance. 
And these are the verses in Ecclesiastes that were our scripture lesson for this morning that Doug read for us. I'm not going to read them all, but you know them. For everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to sow, a time to reap. I first learned those verses through the song. Does everybody know the song? Mamas and the Papas. Well, Pete Seeger wrote it. I don't know if you knew that. And he called it Turn, Turn, Turn to Everything There Is a Season. And he wrote it in the late 50s. He recorded it, but it did become a number one hit in the U.S. for the Birds in 1965 when they recorded it. It was at the time a rallying cry for peace. Pete Seeger only added seven words to the King James Version of those scriptures in order to come up with his song. He added the word turn. Up to everything, turn, turn, turn. Right, so he had to turn three times. And then at the end, he added, I swear it's not too late, which he put after a time for war and a time for peace. Everything else in that song comes from the King James Version of the scripture, according to Wikipedia, although the order was rearranged a little bit so the song would flow a little bit better. So there is another good story in the Bible describing change. Um, there's one from 2 Kings, chapter 2, and I'm going to read a few verses of this to you. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men in the company of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them into pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. So, what does any of this have to do with the scripture lesson we read today? Well, this particular story is full of changes also. We have the transition of Elijah from life on earth to life eternal in a chariot of fire. We have the transition of leadership from Elijah to Elisha. We have the transition through him to on more, through him onto more prophetic work, less talk, more miracles. And throughout the two books of Kings, there is a transition of the leadership of Israel, the breaking up into Israel and Judah, and the change in the calling of the prophets from those who were both prophets and leaders of Israel to those who were just prophets. They were doing the job in a new way. Elisha was learning from his mentor Elijah, and he wasn't ready for him to leave. But when Elijah made it clear he was finally going, Elisha was very bold in his request for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Following his mentor's instructions, he watched, and then he picked up his mantle and performed a miracle so that he could walk back through the parted water and begin his own journey. I found the passing of the mantle a particularly significant part of the story, and one I can relate to on a little bit of some level. Because at annual conference every year, there is a ceremony where the retiring pastors pass the mantle, which they use a stole as the example there, to the newly ordained elders. The newly ordained elders pass the mantle to the newly commissioned provisional members. Those individuals pass the mantle to the newly graduated licensed local pastors. 
and it is a moving ceremony and carries the significance of the mantle being passed from Elijah to Elisha to carry on the important work that God has for him to do. So transition is not easy. Whether it's from one generation to the next, from one president to the next, from one school to the next, we just had a number of kids graduate from high school going on to college, or from one pastor to the next. The transfer of leadership and experience can produce tension and anxiety in any community. But with God's help and the knowledge that he is in control, we can be confident that the changes we face individually and as a congregation will work together to further the kingdom of God and help us make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I'm not the biggest fan of Joel Olstein, but he did say something that I thought was very good, and he said, and I quote, When we are not willing to change, we get stuck in life holding on to what God did in the past instead of growing and moving forward into what God wants us to do in the future. Be open to the new things God has in store for you. Always remember that just because God has blessed you where you are doesn't mean you can just sit back and settle there. God wants to do something new in you and through you. He wants to see you grow, prosper, and flourish. Get ready and keep your heart focused on him. Embrace change and see the blessing God has in store for you. And lastly, I'd like you to remember the words of the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future with hope. Knowing that and keeping those verses in mind makes the idea of change a lot less frightening. So you're thinking, okay, she talked about change, but that wasn't the title. The title was Constancy and Change. So change is good. It's expected of us as Christians to try and change to become more like Jesus. So is it true that the only thing constant in life is change? I'm going to say no. There is something that does not change and lasts forever, and that is God. For I, the Lord, do not change. That is from Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. And in the Psalter that we read this morning, Psalm 102, verse 27, the psalmist declares, But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. God doesn't change. He has always been and always will be never changing, and there is something very comforting in that knowledge. Let us pray. Dear Lord, bless our church and our congregation as we welcome a new pastor, James Murray, into our midst. Give us the courage to face this change with open hearts and open minds, trusting that you know what's best, Lord. We spoke this morning about change, and we know that we need to constantly change to be more like you. But we thank you, God, for being unchanging and unchanged in the face of our troubles and cares. We know you have said, for I, the Lord, do not change, and for that we thank you. As a people who do worry about change, we can look to you to be our unchanging rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you are able and turn in the red hymnal to number 383. And we are going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of This is a Day of New Beginnings.
is responsive. Every season in life is a blessing from God. We are the Lord, in God's blessings. Every purpose under heaven can lead us into life. We need to bring about God's purpose. Every act of kindness is a kindness done to Christ. We go determined to make a difference in our world. Amen. The service has ended. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And remember our coffee hour after church next week. And we will see everyone there. Please say hi to Pastor James and his wife, Katerina.